from there. Look at the ordinary things that everybody around you takes for granted and you take for granted too, as if you have never seen them before, and then proceed from there. In other words, the scientific, second law of science is look at reality. And unfortunately, uh, the mathematical approach to things doesn't look at reality. Do you know the story of the floating island, Laputa, in Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels? <laughs> yeah. And, and you have uh, this island floating up in the air. And uh, there are these uh, philosophers sitting around a table eating lunch together. And they all have long beards and they look unkempt because they're people like me who do th thinking for a living and lose track of everything practical. And they are arguing about the platonic um, ideal of broccoli. And they are arguing from first principles. And they are arguing from logic, what logic says that broccoli should be. The irony is that while they're carrying on this argument, they are eating, guess what? Broccoli. <laughs> and it's actually spilling down their beards. But rather than look down at their plate, they are looking, they're rolling their eyes back in their head, and they're contemplating how logic produces the <laughs> ideal uh, the platonic ideal of a broccoli. <laughs> okay. Well, so there are two different kinds of science. Um, one kind of science is about reasoning way off in, in midair, and then hoping that what you reason in midair connects with reality. Einstein did that. Um, and there's another form of science in which you start from the ground up, and you look at the things around you, and you build your case. And then there's a third form of science that uh, is not as distinct that combines the two, and hopefully I combine the two. So kind of working up the stack then, you, you have a kind of a hierarchy of examples coming up the stack from bacteria to single-celled organisms to multicellular organisms to, right. you know, sort of societies of, of, of animals. And um, you find ways to demonstrate this, this idea at all of these levels. And um, you, you enumerate a set of principles for what constitutes what you call a collective learning machine. Right, a complex adaptive system, to yeah. use the Santa Fe Institute terminology. Yeah. And those principles for a complex adaptive system, a learning machine, are conformity enforcers, diversity generators, resource shifters, inner judges, and intergroup tournaments. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, none of this is accepted. <laughs> this is not part of the standard lore of my disciplines of evolutionary biology. No, it's not. So, so uh, you know, as I understand it, um, what you mean by conformity enforcers, depending on the level that you're talking about, could be, well, the the sort of conservative effects of the genome itself at yep, one level. absolutely. Good it could point. Be, could be social norms right, um, at another level, right? Diversity generators, likewise, at a genetic level, it's going to be mutation and... Um, at a social level, it's going to be things like curiosity and, and deviance. Right, exactly. Right. So those are the very things, and, and I derive these from a lot of science and a lot of, you know, lifetime of science, and, um, and a lot of looking around at, at real stuff um, going on in the real world at all levels. So there's a tremendous value to conformity enforcement. Um, conformity enforcement keeps everybody on the same page. Conformity enforcement allows creatures to uh, connect with each other, to speak the same language. Um, in a bacterial colony, each um, bacterium has its own genome, and Eshel ben Jacob at the University of Tel Aviv, who's done the best work on, on uh, bacteria, and he's an, ironically a physicist, and he's done the best work on bacterial colonies and their communication. And he considers the genome of the individual bacterium to be a computational engine. But you put... Um, you put seven trillion computational engines together in constant communication and allow them to communicate with a chemical language. And they become what he calls a creative web. They're not just capable of calculation. They're not just, remember, a supercomputer. What, what did we discover 30 years ago was a supercomputer that could replace the supercomputers of the Cray Corporation. Um, the Cray Corporation was, to the best of my knowledge, turning out computers that were serial processors and trying to make them power more and more and more and more powerful. Um, other people like Danny Hillis came along and said, hey, why go through just a serial processor? Why not have um, multiple parallel processors? Why not have 360 processors or 3,600 processors? Now, Danny didn't quite achieve this, but other people did. By using 360 or 3,600 processors simultaneously, we ended up with supercomputers even more powerful than the supercomputers of Cray. And um, if you take a look at a bacterial colony, that's 7 trillion processors working in parallel 
every second. And now to to get onto this very interesting notion that you have of what you call the inner judge, um, and it's kind of related to this idea of resource shifting as well. Exactly. Um, but but so I, I, it seems that you sort of analogize all of this collective processing to to something like a neural net. Exactly. Or you know to to a social network because a lot of people are sort of familiar now with power laws and you know, these effects that we see in, in modern social networks where right. basically success breeds success and right. failure begets failure. So, right. so as you, as you are uh, successful, uh, in, you know, in gathering attention to yourself or in demonstrating the ability to solve problems, you form new connections, you, you're reinforced resources and influence accrue to you. Absolutely. And, Got it. Uh, you know, vice versa, if you are, if you are failing, um, you know, you lose connectivity, you lose influence. In a number of places, you seem to link this to to the idea of apoptosis or sort of cell suicide. Absolutely. You lose your health. In other words, from our bacterial days until now, when you and I are talking on the phone, um, we are rigged to self-destruct. We are rigged to self-destruct in the interests of the learning machine. When we go off on a tangent that doesn't prove to be valid, um, and we, we try to get the attention of others with what we found. Those others shun us. But worse than that, when they shun us, the weirdest thing happen inside of us. We have uh, what in the Lucifer principle is called self-destruct mechanisms. And it's called inner judges in uh, global brain. And it's called inner judges because sometimes if we come back with the right thing and everybody goes, oh, my God, and they all crowd around us and they carry us off on their shoulders, the inner judges make us high as a kite. But the, the, the inner judges, if we come back with stuff that doesn't work, or that the group doesn't, whose who's working, the, the group does not see. Exactly. So that's, that's the tragedy of being uh, ahead of the curve with something that is right, but no one understands. Yes. And I mean, it's but a in your view, problem. you're still screwed then, right? It's just too bad. Right. And Van Gogh died thinking he was an utter failure. And yeah. there's no way to communicate with him to tell him what a tremendous success he became. Yeah. Um, but so you, you sort of see this at, at again at sort of different levels, and so uh, you know there's no sort of conscious psychological judgment going on at the lower levels of the stack, but um, up uh, you know in the realm of conscious beings, it, it becomes more of a psychological effect. Right. It, uh, it because of what you just talked about, power laws. I, I prefer to think of them in terms of fractals. The same patterns repeat at level after level after level of nature. Uh, nature started out with a few simple rules, and she's been using them in new forms. Every time she creates a whole new form of matter, a whole new form of activity, um, those those old laws crop up again, but in a new form. So when we have minds, the same things that happen to bacteria happen to you and me. And bacteria and cells are rigged to self-destruct. Mm-hmm. If they prove useless to um, the, the society around them, and if they're not getting constant input, feedback, one of my friends likes to call it. They're not getting constant feedback from the uh, organisms or the cells around them saying, you're important, you're important, you're important, we're listening to you. They begin to self-destruct. First, they sideline themselves, and they shut themselves down, and they use less energy, which is exactly what happens in a neural net. Mm -hmm. And then, if they prove radically unsuccessful, they kill themselves off. You can see this in, um, in lizards, because when two lizards, two lizards will go against each other in a showdown. Most people don't realize that there's, uh, lizards have a social system and the lizards have a hierarchy, a, a pecking order, which is tremendously important to the theories we're talking about. And um, when two lizards go up against each other in a showdown, one tries to show that he can lift his chin higher than the other. And they work at it for minutes with straining with all the muscular power that they've got. The losing lizard, a terrible thing happens to the losing lizard. The winning lizard turns a bright green, and it's it's his interior hormones that are turning him green, and he goes up to the top of the highest thing he can find, a rock, a stick, whatever it is, and he gets into that position that you see at the beginning of The Lion King, where he can look out over all that he surveys and and rule it. (laughs) But the lizard who loses, and that's where the inner judge is kind, but... The losing lizard turns brown, and that's because his system 